welcome to the Untrapped Podcast, where we give motivational and inspirational tips about life, small business, wisdom, health, wealth, finance, relationships. It's about being the best you that you can possibly be. Possibly be, 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 be. Hashtag Untrapped. Welcome, well, welcome to the Untrapped Podcast. 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 I am your host, Keith Kelfus. What's up, guys? This is Keith Kelfus with the Untrapped Podcast, and we have an awesome guest for you. This is a, a, a real estate guy that I actually do his landscaping for. Like, I do landscaping for his properties, and but he's also a friend of mine, and his name is Andrew Sontag, real estate extraordinaire. This guy went from living in a mobile home and started flipping cars and being an entrepreneur directly out of high school, then bought a tanning salon, and he always wanted to get into real estate, and now here it is, six years later, he pulls up to my studio in a Porsche, and he's got 14 <laughs> properties, he's doing Airbnb, he's got streams of residual income, and what's going on, Andrew Sontag? How's it going? Dude. Good to see you. You doing well, man? I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> yep, keeping busy, living the life. Dude, I remember it was like 2011 or 12. Mm -hmm. uh, it's winter time. I'm all, I'm all pale. I'm like, let's go to the tanning salon, right? And yep. I walk up in there, and I don't know, for some reason, we just started talking about, I think it was like silver or economics. Or yeah, something. it was some kind of, it was different conspiracy theories at the time, I think. <laughs> yeah, we were like talking about 9 -11 Yeah, we were like really big conspiracy theorists back then. Um, so yeah, I think that's what we started talking about, and then it kind of flowed into business from there. Oh, yeah. So we talked yeah. about silver. And then uh, Kiyosaki. I was in MLM, multi-level marketing, back in the day, and they gave us all these Kiyosaki books. And I was like, you never read Kiyosaki? And you're like, so I'm like, don't even buy the book. I just drop <laughs> off and like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Cashflow Quadrant. And then you actually started, in between the times that you decided you wanted to sell that tanning salon, you were yeah. reading all these real estate books, and then you just went for it, bro. And now yep. you got all these properties. Talk about all that. Yeah, so I always knew that I wanted to be in real estate. Um, I was more uh, interested in the flipping side of it. Um, always watching the flipping shows and everything. And you know, I knew about rental properties, but I don't think I really knew um, the benefit of residual income in building up a rental portfolio um, until you introduced me to Rich Dad Poor Dad. And once I read that, I was like, I want houses, I want apartment buildings. Um, and I ended up buying my, my first rental property in 2013. And then from there got into flipping properties and Airbnbs, you know, two or three years later. Um, so yeah, if it wasn't for that book, I don't know if I ever, if I ever even would have got into flipping properties. So I had an interest in it, but that book kind of opened up the door and realized that my tanning salon was a job that I bought. It was not a business. It was a job. And that book made me realize I had to get out of it and figure out how to, um, get residual income going. There was a point at the end, of the last year of you owning that tanning salon, like, uh, even though I was, I, either I was starting my business or I was in between, I was getting mine going as well. Cause yeah. you already had a business, mm -hmm. but I would drive past the tanning salon at like, no matter, it didn't matter what time of the day I drove yep. past, I would I look through there. the windows and you'd be behind <laughs> the counter. But you yeah. were on your MacBook, dude, studying. Yeah, I was always watching YouTube videos or trying to make, you know, trying to make the time that I was there valuable. I was always trying to educate myself with something. Because um, I knew it was just, it was basically time wasted there. I was there from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. And, you know, sometimes I would hire someone if I had to, if I had to get out and do something. But it was kind of, it was a huge, you know, uh waste of money to have someone sitting there because it was like they wouldn't sell how you would sell so it was like if you weren't there the business really didn't didn't work out so that's yeah. when i knew i had to get out of there <laughs> that's what he said you don't own a business you own a job yep. right mm -hmm. and it's funny because when i originally bought that my accountant said that to me he made a little comment and he was like well you just bought yourself a job and i'm like what is he talking about like i didn't ask i didn't i didn't like physically look at him and ask him i just was like hmm, that's an interesting topic and then Three years later, I realized what he was talking about. <laughs> so, now, what made you go for it? I remember, like, you, you got your first property, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll get into that, because that's cool, because I, I, man I maintenance your property. It's like, I'll come in and cut everything down, clean mm -hmm. it up, put new sod, whatever needs to yep. be done, so you can flip it, sell it, rent it. Right. But uh, I remember, like, the last year you felt like you were in a prison at that tanning salon. Like, you were, yeah. you were going crazy. Yeah, because it was like, you know, before... I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. I was already 
kind of worn out just the time that I was spending there. And I didn't realize that at that point that I had a job of owning that tanning salon. I didn't, I still thought I was a business owner, you know? So I was worn out, but I was trying to figure out like how to build that business up. And once I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, I realized there, there is no more building this business up. This business is what it is. You know, there's only, the only people gonna, that are going to come to this business are within a couple mile radius. That's, a, that's all you have. Like there's no more bringing in extra outside business than there already is. Like I was already at max capacity. So it was like, to grow it, what are you going to grow? How are you going to grow it? You can't. So that's when I realized, like, I'm in a prison. <laughs> I got to get out of here. I got to get into real estate, residual income. I remember income. that conversation that we had. It was, like, 2012 or something. Yeah. I was like, bro, I just got a membership at Planet Fitness, and they have free tanning. It's right down the street. Mm-hmm. And then, like... Yeah, that's actually... All the Planet Fitnesses started opening up, I want to say, like, maybe six months to 12 months before I... I sold the place. I feel like I got out of there right in time. You know, I I was able to sell it for, I think, a little bit more than what I bought it for. Um, yeah, if I wouldn't have sold it that year, I feel like I just would have had to lock the door and walk away. Damn, dude. So w- yeah. were you uh, scared? To sell it? No, when you actually, I'm sorry, when you, when you got your first property. Like, I know that... You're the one who told me way back in the day you got to separate your personal from your business expenses, and yeah. you're really good at accounting and math. Mm-hmm. You uh, you went to college and all that shit, and it, you said that you learned more from books than you did in college. But yeah, for sure. I mean, college. I feel like the only thing college really taught me was to meet deadlines and you know study for certain upcoming tests and that kind of thing. But it didn't teach me like the real world how to do things in business, you know? So you learning all that yourself and then getting into your properties, which you got 16 now, th- how many are Airbnb? 14. 14? 14 properties. Uh, five of them are Airbnb. And how old are you? Uh, 31. So when, how did you get your first property? Because that, that was always kind of puzzled me. You, yeah. You had- so my first one, my dad's a real estate agent and broker. Um, so dad, he, just to be clear, like your dad didn't do, sh- he didn't give you shit. Not, no, your dad's he a was, great guy. yeah, he's, he's actually, he now owns some rental properties, but yes. he didn't start buying rental properties until like four or five years after I was already buying them. And he realized it was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I remember he, he was a real estate agent, basically just worked as like, you know, a listing broker, um, would sometimes help people, you know, buy their homes as well, take them around, show them homes. Yeah. Uh, but well, he also the only reason I said that is because if when anybody says like, "Oh, my dad," then somebody watching might be like, "Oh, his dad." He was like, no, no, no. His dad's a phenomenal guy, but you did this all by yourself. Yeah, neither one of both my parents are great, but neither one of them have ever had like you know a ton of money or anything. Yeah. Um, so my dad was already in real estate on the sales end of it. Um, he did manage a couple rental properties. Um, so the first property that I bought was actually one that he had managed for a couple of years. So at the time I was looking for my first personal house. So my dad's, me and my dad are driving around one day, um, looking around like Royal Oak, Berkeley area, um, for a personal home for myself. And, um, uh, something, someone called him. I don't know if it was, I think it was the, the owner of this house that he was managing at the time. Um, and he had to swing by there, take care of some maintenance issues. Um, He's like, do you mind if we stop over there? It's only like five minutes away. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. So we head over to this house. It's in Oak Park. Uh, at the time, I wasn't really familiar with Oak Park. Um, but we get over there and, you know, my dad's doing what he's doing. I'm just taking a look around the house. And I'm like, this is actually a, a pretty nice house. I was like, what does this rent for? And he's like, uh, we've been renting it for like maybe 900 950 a month. And I'm like, really? That's, that's pretty good. I was like, and he, I think my dad mentioned something about the guy wanting to sell the house. And... I asked him what he wants to sell it for. And my dad said, you know, probably, probably around like 35 to maybe 50 grand at the most. These houses aren't, aren't going for a lot right now. And I'm like, really? I was like, that's a really good return to get, you know, 900, 950 a month when you're only investing 50,000 at the very most. So I kind of, I was just like, you know, thinking about it in my head, didn't tell my dad I wanted to buy it or anything at the time. And then, um, maybe a week or two went by and I was just reading more and more, you know, Robert Kiyosaki books and that kind of stuff and just crunching the numbers on what my dad was telling me about that house. 
And I just gave my dad a call and I was like, Hey, you know, I, I think I want to buy that house, but I don't know. I, I can't right now because I, you know, I have my primary mortgage for my primary house. Like I really can't get the financing. Do you think the guy will do a land contract? And if anyone doesn't know what land contract is, it's basically owner financing. So the seller of the house was basically the bank. Um, so my dad talked to the guy and, you know, talked him into doing a land contract and I was able to pick that up on a land contract and, and started my first rental property from there. So, so how much actual money down did you put down and how much to uh, like paint the walls? I think it was about 10 K I put down. Um, and the house actually really did not need that much work. I went in and did like a few minor corrections. So it passed, you know, rental mm-hmm. inspection, just switched out a couple, uh, GFCI outlets. Um, I think I, switched out a couple light fixtures just to kind of update them. It had like those old brass light fixtures. And now if, now if I was buying that house, I would not be spending money on swapping out the light fixtures. It's a, it's a rental house, you know, you're going to get the same amount per month regardless. Um, so yeah, I, I basically put 10 grand down, maybe, maybe three to 500 bucks in quick repairs. And that was about it. Wow. And then I actually ended up renting it for a thousand a month. So a little more than, than what my dad had, been previously renting it out for when he was managing it. So the first property, would you say, was really hard, stressful? Um, it was. It wasn't hard or stressful by any means, um, and I think that's mainly because I had my dad to constantly call every five minutes and mm-hmm. say, like, you know, how do I execute this lease? Like, how do I do this? This tenant's asking me this, so I, I had my dad to fall back on to answer questions. Mm-hmm. By no means was he there, like, holding my hand, like, showing me exactly what to do, but. I'd call him with a question and he'd kind of send me down the right route to figure it out. So it was nice that I had that to fall back on. Um, if you do want to get into rental real estate and you don't have, you know, someone in the business, a family member that you can fall back on, um, find just a good agent in general. That's not only a salesperson, but involved in rental real estate that actually Uh, owns rental real estate and has been through the process of signing leases and evicting people. And they will by all means answer your questions and, you know, help you through the process. Bro. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting me being a landscaper and uh, maintenancing his properties. (laughs) And I'll, I'll put a link in the description below of a video of me on actually one of his properties. It's a vlog. He'll show you the whole inside of the house. There was like 10 grand in concrete. That, you had to yeah, that was one of the very, I think that was like maybe the third flip that I did. Yeah, dude. That one, I was still like very new to everything. That was, I actually watched that like six months ago and I'm like, <laughs> I just, I mean, like I knew what one, I was man. doing in that video, but now looking back, I'm like, I just have everything systematized, systematized. so much better. You got the Airbnb systematized too. Like you guys yeah. aren't, um, you're not cleaning them. You're not no. setting everything. Yeah, the Airbnbs were a lot of. I would say the first two were a lot of work getting them set up, um, and then we continued to clean them after ourselves after every guest, which was so much time. Um, but now we have it pretty systematized. We have you know cleaners that take care of everything. Uh, yeah. So so let's say the second, third, fourth, fifth property. Once you get get it going, is it mm-hmm. get easier? Yes, for sure. I mean, I would say even with my long-term rentals now, I'm up to uh, nine long-term rentals. And even every time I get one of those and go through the process of putting a new tenant in or evicting a tenant and you know having turnover, I'm constantly learning something new of what I can systematize. So when you say systematize, I'm fascinated by the whole system thing. Cause mm-hmm. Part of my brain, like, w- like what do you mean system? And yeah. e- even though I put some in my business that actually work, how does that look like to you? Give an example of an actual system, a process. So a good example is, I guess, moving a new tenant in. Um, my very first tenant, I had a basic lease and I kind of just walked him through the lease, had him sign, and that was it. Now, you know, I've, I've learned that a lot of tenants, they don't know what to expect unless you tell them what to expect or how things are going to work. So... Now, anytime I, I bring a new tenant in, I, I kind of show them around the house, the little quirks, the little things that may occur. 
and show them how to do quick fixes. I show them, you know, where the circuit panel is. If, if a fuse were to blow, like just come down here and flip the switch rather than me getting a maintenance call that, you know, the bedroom light stopped working because I was using the blair, hair, hair, hair dryer. And now I got to drive out there and flip the switch. It's like, if they know where that is and know about those little things, they can take it on themselves. And I kind of walk them through, you know, how other maintenance issues would get handled. I give them, now I give them with their lease, um, a sheet with all the maintenance numbers on them of this is a, con this is considered an emergency. This is not considered an emergency. If this happens, do not call me in the middle of the night, wait until eight or 9am to call me. If this happens, it is an emergency and you can call me at two in the morning. Um, just kind of set their expectations and, it will save you a lot of stress and a lot of just time oh, consuming and it also phone communicates calls. communicates that you have structure and that you yes. care, so they trust you as a landlord. Right. And it's not, you know, they know what to expect. So it's like if they're calling you about something that's on that sheet that they shouldn't be calling you about at 2 a.m., they're not sitting there fretting, thinking, why isn't he calling me back? Like, and that means the, that you didn't do you your know, job. Right. Ah. So I, you basically set their expect expectations of what my job is in what their job is, you know, and it kind of builds that relationship of how we're going to work back and forth, you know, um, give them examples of what they should be emailing you about versus texting you about or calling you about. Otherwise you get those tenants that they'll text you about everything. They'll text you about how their day's going, which way the sun's shining in their living room window, you know? So it's like, you kind of want to put a barrier up of, um, you know, who you are to them. You're not their friend, you're their landlord. And yeah, just kind of set the expectations from there. So um, yeah, other than that, system-wise, I would say like looking back at the flips and stuff, we've really systematized uh, just our overall contractors um, process of getting things done. Um, we used to meet, uh, say like our plumber or our electrician or our carpenter at every single house and walk through every single bid with them. Now we've gotten to the point where our electrician, our plumber, our, um, you know, any other contractor that we have, they, they're, they pretty much know what we want and what we expect. Hey, uh, reach and pull the Kiyosaki book off the shelf. Oh, uh, right. uh, Richie Rich poured in. Bed. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So again, um, uh, we had to reset the camera, but okay. So once you started getting like five, six, seven properties, I know that you had all the stuff you were, you're coming into, like obviously the landscaping need to be done and mm -hmm. doesn't every single house have its own type of like process. I mean, yeah, like you're running into stuff because they say, Oh, like their own unique problems. I don't know if I'd call yeah. it a fear, but if somebody wants to get into real estate or maybe take money that they're making from running, say their contractor business and say, Hey, I want to get into real estate. Yeah. What if I get a house and I didn't know there was mold or right. cracked foundation or what mm -hmm. if, how do I know this is going to work? Can you kind of, yeah. So once certainty, yeah, I would say the first, like my first personal home that I bought, um, and I want to say maybe the next couple homes after that, I actually paid for a home inspector to come through and do an inspection on the house. You know, they cost like, I don't know, like 200, 250 bucks. So you for, just Google home inspector or you ask around? To people yeah. Know? Yeah. And there's, there's people out there that do home inspections and they kind of just show you, you know, the basics of what to look for. Um, and then I would say by the time I bought my third or fourth property, there was really no need to have that inspector there. I was kind of in tune with what to look for and, and what could pop up. Um, not to say that I don't continue to learn and find issues on properties moving forward, but you just kind of take it from there. And then, the, you know, after you buy, you know, five, 10 properties, you've had your fair share of issues pop up or surprises that pop up. And you just, you know, you continue to learn what to look for in the next one. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Uh 2018 was the smoothest year we've ever had in my contracting business. We do landscaping and window cleaning, obviously. And I look back, I'm like, wait a second. Oh, it's just because I had been doing it so long that nothing. It's now all me. systematized and you have, you know what to expect. I think I was telling you the same thing the other day on the phone. I was like, I feel like 2018 was one of our smoothest, most systematized years. Like we really got everything in order that, 
um, it just kept the level of stress down. You know, we knew what to expect. There wasn't constant running around doing little miscellaneous tasks that we could pay other people to do. Did you did you get frustrated? Like, was things taking up your time where you drew your line in the sand? That's it. I'm not yeah. any longer doing this. Yep. I'm outsourcing. Yeah, I think the biggest thing was cleaning the Airbnbs. Like, at the beginning of 2018, like, I was just – we did it most of 2017. And then 2018 rolled around, and I was like, all right, now we have three properties. This is this is taking up way too much of our time. Like, we're basically being a maid at this house, and nothing against people who want to be maids or anything, but it's like, I know that I can put my time somewhere else and make more money, whereas someone, and someone else can do a better job cleaning than I can, you know? So it's like, why not pay that person that can do that, and I can be out doing something I want to do, enjoy doing, and make more money. Closing deals and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so there's ten dollar an hour work, hundred dollar an hour work, thousand dollar, yep, ten thousand dollar an hour work. Yeah, and by the way, it was not very easy to find a cleaner. We we went through many many cleaners. Where at one point, I think my partner even said to me, he's like, I think we just have to clean these ourselves. And I'm like, no, we will find the right cleaner. And we eventually did find the right cleaner. I mean, we had plenty of hangups where we didn't have cleaners show up, and we had guests walking into dirty homes and got bad reviews about it. But we worked through it and, you know, tried out another cleaner and wow. just kept pushing through. And now we got it. Now we have a good system down where we have a, a staff of cleaners that we can trust. And yeah. So everything's beautifully clean. Do you do the champagne bottle thing? Uh, we give a bottle of wine. Yeah. That's so awesome. every guest gets a bottle of wine when they check in, um, which. What about the booking secret, the guesty thing? Uh, yeah. So we have, um, there's an automated uh, message system called Guesty. Uh, we use that to kind of coordinate with our guests on all like the basic communications. We still have to go in there and answer, you know, I guess descriptive questions and stuff that Guesty wouldn't know how to answer. Mm -hmm. um, but Guesty really helps out, you know, in the initial booking process and then sending out instructions of check in and check out and checking so in on the guests. And that Guesty kind of thing. is an online, it's a website where there's real virtual assistants that yeah, so they they have a couple different systems. So Guesty. they have Guesty. So there's one system that you can buy where it's like just all automated messages. And then the next, I think, upgrade to that is an, a true person receiving your messages, reading them, and answering back. Um, we started with that service, and we found that they really didn't answer in the the detail that we needed them to. So we stepped down to the lower one. So they're just sending out you know the automated check in, check out instructions, that kind of thing, basic, you know, instructions. And then we still, like I said, answer the, the in-depth questions that need detail. That makes sense. So I, I want to ask you about, uh, I want to ask you one thing and then this, I do. So I want to ask you about like the taxes. Can you roll into another property to, um, to not pay unnecessary too much in taxes and all that. But I also mm -hmm. want to ask you, like, what is, like, one of the most stressful, oh, shit moments that you had that was, like, um, with a property? Maybe it was all going to fall apart. Because I know that you're successful. You're making really good money now. You're making residual income. Mm -hmm. I, I got so many questions for you. Um, it's hard to think of, it's hard to think of a, a time where I thought it would, like, all fall apart. Um, I've always been... I don't know. I've always gone into every deal knowing there could be problems, knowing that I could lose money. So fortunately, I don't think just set, I was able to set up my mindset enough that I don't feel like I was ever back into a corner where I was like, this is the end. It's all going to collapse. Um, I did see a picture of you on Instagram. You got, a, uh, it was your Porsche or your BMW and you had like a bunch of stuff in there from Home Depot. Oh and yeah. Like, I think that was when I had what's your uh, Instagram handle, uh, Lord Sontag. S O N N T A G. Lord Sontag at Lord Sontag. Lord Sontag Instagram. Okay, yeah. keep going. Um, yeah, I think I think that was when I had my uh, a two door BMW and I had to pick up some uh, some Arborvitaes and I just I literally stuffed. <laughs> I think it. <laughs> I stuffed like maybe five or yeah. six. Here, why like, why did we the Arborvitaes? Like five foot Arborvitaes. Because he in called this, me up in this like, BMW. Yeah. He's like, hey bro, how much do uh, and you send me pictures of the property? Smart. How much to put Arborvitaes in this area? I was like, uh, like eighteen hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And you're like, screw that. 
No, you like, wanted you wanted like some crazy delivery charge, and I was like, I'll take care of this myself. I'll go to Home Depot and rent a Home Depot truck for twenty dollars. Well, they were out that day; they didn't have any trucks available, and it was I think it was in October. It was like the end of the season; like they were not getting any more Arborvitaes in. This house had to go on the market within like two weeks, and I was like, I have to buy them today, otherwise they're going to be gone. So I was like, I bought twenty of them, and I'm like, I'm just going to fit as many as I can in my car, and I made like four trips that day. Just loading them up in my car and taking them back to the house. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. So okay. So now with the so th- and that's actually a good example of like you know where you can think something's going to completely collapse. Whereas like I don't know if if oh, cool. everyone would actually you know take their BMW up there and load it up with a whole bunch of shrubs and drive it home. It's like I just I don't know. I just know that I have to do something and I make it work regardless of what I have to do. So. Yeah. That's one thing I always notice is you focus all your problem. I mean, you're not on the problem. All your focus is on the solution. Yes. Yeah. I'm always about finding the solution, which I don't know where that came from. I'm very glad that I have that. <laughs> um, you're definitely a warrior. But I, I definitely try to, to solve the problem many, many times before I actually walk away. And I, I don't know if I there's – I can't even think of many things that I've actually, like, thrown the hat in and was like – this is it. We're done. Like, it's not going to work. No, I'd never hear Andrew whine, bitch, or complain. There's maybe once or twice in knowing him a decade where he had an issue he had to, like, work through. He might have called me or something, and we, you know, whatever you work through, it has nothing yeah. to do with me. But, like, the interesting thing is, yeah, you just don't whine, bitch, well, I think it was. Well, I think it was something that you told me a long time ago, or maybe it was in a book that you gave me, where it was like, don't take no for an answer. And I've really taken that saying and just held it to like everything. Whereas whether it comes down to a, you know, something that I have to figure a solution out for or anything, like I, I really have a hard time taking no or the response of it will not work for the answer. Like I, you know, I feel like you can make anything work. It's awesome. Cause if someone else did it, then you can do it. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, Eric Reno, and you guys know Eric Reno. He was wanted to get into real estate, and mm-hmm. he actually was calling you in the beginning for advice and stuff. Yep. Because you got yeah, and he has quite a few rental properties now. I think he might have more than me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, he actually did. A, did he do a roof for one of your properties? Or yeah, something? he's done quite a few roofs for our properties. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so with all this happening, and then you, you finally the revenues coming in. Mm-hmm. Are you the type that like every time you get any money in the bank, you just keep slapping it on more properties? Like you live yeah. just at the edge. Yeah, the I have. <laughs> I have a really hard time keeping money in the bank because it doesn't make anything in the bank, and it's like I know I can go throw it into a property and make you know fifteen, twenty, twenty five percent back. So yeah, I feel like any time I get you know a good amount of money, whether it's from selling a flip or anything, it's like I'm looking for that next uh, rental property to pick up. Is it almost like an addiction? Yes, for sure, it really is. Because I can't tell you how many times I've tried to like map out or plan out my personal life financially, and I'm like, all right, well, I'm I'm selling this flip. We're gonna do well on it. I'm gonna take care of this, this, and this. I'm gonna finish my basement at home or this. And it immediately just turns into me looking for that next property, finding it, putting more than I expected that I wanted to put into it, which is a good thing because I'm making a good return on it. But it's like I'm constantly looking for that next deal. So it's it's hard to get a – it's hard to – I don't know. <laughs> You're very passionate about it. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So now with the whole tax thing um, – because you're an entrepreneur, you're able to take advantage of certain tax laws and roll things in. Yeah, I know you so made a shit a load of money in taxes too. Yeah, I, I, I still need to get the whole you know tax code down a little better and figure out how I can take better advantage of that because um, I do pay too much in taxes still. Um, but yeah, there's there's a a certain tax loophole, or I shouldn't call it a loophole because they set it up for this, but where you can sell a property instead of paying taxes on that in that year, you can roll it over into another property and kind of defer the taxes. Eventually when you sell whatever property it is, you'll have to pay all the taxes, but you can kind of defer those taxes. I have yet to be able to take advantage of that because it's a very, there's very strict guidelines to kind of making that whole thing work. And I really don't understand the whole process of it yet. 
Um, I think it works better on like larger properties. If you were to have say an eight unit apartment building and you were going to sell it for say a $500,000 profit, you could roll it into, you know, a 20 unit apartment building and kind of defer the taxes on it. Um, so I've yet to take advantage of that, but I have been able to take advantage of depreciation in real estate. So when you own um, a rental home, you get to not only pay off the interest or write off the interest on the mortgage that you're making every month, but you also, it's a depreciating asset. So say you paid $100,000 for that home, you get to depreciate, I don't know if it's all of the 100,000, maybe I think it might only be like 70 or 80%, I could be completely wrong, but you get to depreciate that asset, meaning you get to have more money that you get to write off on taxes, so. Uh, what do you think about four greenhouses equals one red hotel, that whole thing? Yeah, I like the whole concept of that. Um, I originally, when I originally got into rental real estate, I, well, I still am. I'm, I'm still buying single family homes. Eventually I would like to convert all those single family homes over to one big multifamily because I feel like it would be easier to take care of. Um, you know, you have one maintenance guy that would know all the properties and they're all the same floor plan. And it's, it's more systematized than having, you know, 10, 20, 30 different unique homes in different areas with their own little different problems. Some on basements, some on crawls, some colonial, some with garages, you know, you, that just opens up the door to just a whole bunch of individual little issues. You know, that makes me think you, who are some of your early mentors, like looking at maybe like a Grant Cardone or anybody in the real estate market? I'm just guessing. And do you follow anybody anymore? You got your own thing that you do and you don't pay attention to anybody. Um, I wish I followed people more like, you know, Robert Kiyosaki was definitely a huge one where I, I read a lot of his books and watched videos and everything. I was always trying to find stuff on him. Um, Mike Dillard was another big one. He's not so much in real estate, but he's he's very passionate about um residual income and trying to own your own time, I guess, rather than be out there working a job and everything. Um, I haven't been as active in watching and reading videos of mentors that, that I should be. I'm trying to get back into that. I've just been, you know, crazy busy building my business, but, yeah, exactly. um, I actually did just start listening to the Mike Dillard podcast that you were talking about Dude, the self -made a little while ago. Is good. Yeah. And I think I'm on like episode two or three and that's pretty good. So I'm going to start listening to that in the car. <laughs> um, did you hear that one episode? I think I sent it to you. The, I forgot the guy's name. He was talking about the Airbnbs, how he has them all over the country. And he's um, doing like $3 million a month. So he I don't think so. No, he doesn't own any of the properties. He rents them out from other landlords. Mm -hmm. And then turns them into Airbnb. So he has literally yeah. no, he doesn't have to get a mortgage or slack. And that's what we started doing too. So our first two Airbnbs that we bought, um, we bought, you know, outright with a normal mortgage on it. And then just looking at cash flow and, and, you know, how everything worked with Airbnb on those first two properties, I got to, to thinking it's like you want an Airbnb in a good area and to have an airbnb in a good area you have to pay top dollar for that real estate or you have to buy a very distressed piece of property in that area and spend a lot of money fixing it up because people want high quality airbnbs they don't want you know your standard long-term rental property that you have that has a, you know a 20 year old kitchen or whatever so it was well, we were looking for like our third Airbnb, it was difficult to find one where the cash flow worked without us, you know, putting $40,000 down in order to get a payment that we needed that would work cash flow wise with the Airbnb. So that's when I just thought myself of just renting, you know, an A property in a prime location. And then you don't have to worry about a down payment. You don't have to worry about fixing anything because now you have a landlord to fix things. And so it's you not know, about what you own, it's about what you control. Yeah. So we got into our, our next three that we bought were all rentals. Um, and yeah, we, it took a little bit, you know, it took a little longer to find because we had to find landlords that were cool with us using it as an Airbnb. And there actually are a lot more landlords out there that are, are cool with it than you would think. Um, it's just a matter of finding them and being able to have that conversation and educate them on Airbnb if they don't already know about it. Um, oh, but wait yeah. a second. So 
I was under the impression like one out of six land lords would say yes, the other five would say no. Mm-hmm. But you and I would I would say that's about it, it, that's about right. Yeah, but it's a lot easier to find them than. Uh, you know, it's not like you're getting no after no after no after no after no. Usually you actually have, I would say, every few actually want to hear about it or at least let you educate them on it. And some of them still say no after they've been educated on it. Because you said you don't take no but, for an answer, so you take time to educate them so they right. see how they see it as mm-hmm. an opportunity. Yep. And you're going to be a solid tenant anyways. So after I listened to that podcast, I was so excited. I was talking to my wife about it. I'm like, Do we should get into Airbnb. Let's start out with one property. Let's do it. And then I called a a client of mine who has like 25 properties here in Michigan in the local area. I'm like, dude, did you know that you could rent out properties and turn them into Airbnbs? You know how to buy them? I'm like, like, he's like, Keith, I already know all this stuff. If, if I could find somebody to insure me, I would have done that five years ago and I'd already be doing it. You can't do it around here. And mm-hmm. I took his word as law because he's got 25 properties. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't work around here. Yeah. there's. I'm like, oh, that was the catch. But you're finding totally the opposite. Yeah. So our first couple properties, um, we did have an issue with the, you know, the insurance company getting wind that it was an Airbnb and they didn't want to insure it. So we had to go through, a, we had to call around to a couple different, you know, insurance companies that would you know, cover us on those properties, knowing it was an Airbnb and we had to pay a little higher rate. Um, but then when you get into renting the properties, it's kind of a different thing because you aren't carrying, you know, regular insurance on that property. The same as if you would, if you had a mortgage and actually owned that property, all you have to carry is renter's insurance. And then outside of that, Airbnb has, I think it's a million dollar um, liability and property damage policy that covers you as soon as someone rents out your place. It's not an additional cost that you have to pay Airbnb for. The fees that they take from your bookings automatically give you that insurance and, and cover you. And um, they're actually very good about paying out too. We've had, we've actually only had one instance out of, I would say, 500 plus guests where we actually had to take advantage of that insurance from Airbnb. Um, and it was maybe, I would say two to $3,000 in damages. It wasn't a whole lot, but, uh, we were able to call Airbnb that day. They had us document everything, um, just in writing, send pictures in. And I would say it was within a couple hours that they approved the claim. And within, I would say 48 to 72 hours, we hit, we were reimbursed all of that money. Um, so it was actually much easier than it would have been working with a regular insurance company. Cause I don't, if, if any of you have worked with regular insurance companies, whether it comes to an auto claim or, you know, a homeowner's claim, you know, you're not getting that, that money in 72 hours. It's, it's a good couple week to month process. There's just one thing I noticed, like if you call me on the phone or if I call you on the phone, the quality of conversations that we have, cause we might, we probably see each other like a couple times a year. Mm-hmm. most of it's just over the phone. There's like an instant clock ticking when I'm on the phone with him and I can feel he's snappy. Like, so when we talk, it's just pure high quality value. We get to the point of what we're talking about or we get like that aha or we'll coach each other with something real quick. And then as soon as that point's done, we go, okay, bye. And we get the fuck off the phone. Yeah, I, well, I feel we like we, linger. we started that a long time ago. Like we both respect each other's time. Like, as soon as it gets to like dead silent and neither one of us have anything to say, it's like, we don't just, you know, reiterate back to like what normal people would be like. So how was your day? Like, I don't think we've ever asked each other, how was your day? (laughs) And, uh, wasn't it, didn't Ashley make that comment before that? Like you were rude to me on the phone. And I was like, no, he wasn't rude. Like we just got to the point and there wasn't anything to talk about. Like, we don't need to talk about, Oh, what'd you do last weekend? Did you have a good dinner? Like, I don't care what you ate. I don't even know what I ate. Like, you know, just yeah, I, think <laughs> I was on the phone with you or something in the car with my wife or I don't know what it was, but when I got off the phone with you, it was like, all right, I got to go by mm-hmm. something like that. And, uh, she's like, <gasps> You're an asshole. Why would, you, <laughs> why would you just do that to your friend? Yeah, like, and he actually called me back, and he was like, "Hey, I'm sorry. Um, Ashley just said I was an asshole." And I was like, "What? No, no, you're <laughs> totally fine." He's like, "He's like, <laughs> she said you're. She said I was short with you or whatever." I'm like, "No, it was totally fine. Like, we don't need to." I like it's uh like the ability to hear no and say no with no residue, uh, yeah. to be very cut and dry and very to the point and just very stern. 
mm-hmm. like when people are like that. Like they almost come across as an asshole because it's just pure meat and potatoes, yeah. dude. And I don't have that with everyone. Like I've I've told you before, like I'm sometimes trapped on the phone with certain people where it's like I don't know how to get out of this this conversation. Like I can't say I have to go. And I don't know what it is. It's like certain personalities like pull you in and it's like, how do I get out of this? <laughs> they just keep blabbing and blabbing. Yeah. So how do you um that's a huge thing. I notice you're you're laser focused on your career, on your success. And obviously you're not married, you don't have any kids yet. Mm-hmm. But also, the whole healthy boundaries things, like friends that want to hang out too much, were you ever stuck in that where you felt like... Yeah, and I feel like I still am with at times, you know, depending on who it is or what's going on. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I've, I, I really... The last couple of years, I really haven't had a problem with saying, like, no, I just don't have any interest in doing that. Before, I felt like I was attending a lot more like functions or things that I was invited to just because I was invited to go. And then I got there and I'm just like looking at my watch, like when can I get out of here? And now I've, I've really taken a step back and kind of, I guess, I don't know. I, I have the courage just to say like, Nope, don't want to do it. Not interested. I'll catch up with you after, you know? So that's one of the, and I'm still developing that. I mean, it's like, you're there's certain people that I can't do that with. Like but. I legit went in his his house. Like he's got a nice house, uh, like a couple cities away. And like, dude, he's always spotless clean. His car is spotless clean. I went, <laughs> dude. I went in. Your it's house. really not though. From the for you looking at it from the outside yeah. might look like that, but it's like your house know. is so clean. I actually, I'm sorry, like, you're my friend. I know you for like ten years. I started opening up his dresser drawers. I'm like, there's no way he's <laughs> all his shits folded, all perfect. I was like. Are you like OCD or something? I am OCD. I really am. So that shows that. But if you smell, I just your- don't like a whole bunch of junk around. Like if 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 there's something in my house and I have not used it in a year, whether it's like an article of clothing or just anything, I'm like, why do I have it? Get rid of it. You know, even like a Bluetooth speaker sitting around that I haven't used for a year. Why do I have it? Get rid of it. Um, I don't like the idea of having a whole bunch of like shit that you don't need. Smart. Yeah. And I actually, I feel like I have way too much stuff than I really do need, but I always try to like, you know, keep okay. it to a minimum. I want to ask you about, um, uh, silver, silver prices are down <laughs> and, uh, this is going to turn half the people away. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> They're going to be like your conspiracy theorist. Um, no, I think silver is a good thing to own and buy. And I feel like right now it's a good buying opportunity because price is low, but you have to make your own decision on that. Educate yourself on that. And if it's something you're interested in and want to buy, buy it. Don't go and buy it just because, you know, Keith and I are telling you to go and buy it. <laughs> so I remember I came into, uh, I called you one time. I was you like, got me hooked. <laughs> I was like, I read Mike Maloney's guide to, to investing in precious metals. It's an emergency. Yep. Did you know he's got an offshore like account with yeah like an underground bunker i read that book i thought it was all gonna crash (laughs) Yeah, dude. but now i've i've you know i've gotten rid of the conspiracy side of it and i understand the true um investment side of it and yeah dude a lot of that stuff pissed me off looking back because i wasted a lot of time worrying about unnecessary stuff yeah because every year it's supposed to be the end of the world but at the same time it educated you how to analyze things moving forward You know, like I kind of looked at, I feel like everything back then that we looked at, whether it was silver and gold or anything, we dove in and just like grabbed it by the horns and that was it. Like it was ride or die. And it's like now I kind of just, it's, it's really taught me how to look at things from a larger perspective, you know, instead of focusing so far into that. That makes sense. So how do you how do you see the forest for this the trees? Like have you, you took an IQ test? I was talking oh, yeah, about yeah, it in the last yeah. podcast with yep. uh, John Haddad. And I was like, I've never taken an IQ test. I want to take one. Mm-hmm. So, dude, you scored one twenty two. It was probably all, and just, that was only your first. It was probably time. all pure chance. <laughs> <laughs> what What did you score in spatial intelligence? Oh, I don't remember the exact detail. I don't. I sent you a screenshot of it. I don't know. Okay, so if you go back in the website, like mm-hmm. do it when you go. It's worth it. It'll show the gradients of yeah. what all these things mean. 
and then it'll make a lot more sense. Yeah, I did read through there or read through all those little segments. Um, but yeah, so you can like look at uh, you can look at an environment and quickly synthesize in your brain because your brain just kind of interprets everything that's going on from your senses and then makes mm -hmm. a map of it. And the map is not the territory, but you have a very clear representation of reality: what's real, what's solid, what can, what rules. Can yeah, and it hasn't. It, it always, it hasn't always been like that. I feel like that's something that I've slowly been able to develop, and and still I am developing. I mean, it's not. I find it interesting how you're always pushing the boundary and trying to go farther and higher. What is the big mm -hmm. dream? I know, like you were like obsessed with. I know it's materialistic, but like the Lamborghini. Marshall yeah, Lando. and actually, I don't really, you know, I'm not a huge. Um, I love cars, um, but yeah, before I was obsessed with the Lamborghini Aventador, and now I don't. I don't even know if I would want one because number one, to keep that thing clean, is just that's <laughs> that's an issue in itself. Um, but I don't know if I'd want to be driving around in something like that and it just draws too much attention even if you get you know a black one or a gray one that isn't that flashy it's like you're still gonna just be bombarded with people wanting to talk to you and take pictures and that kind of stuff and it's like i don't i don't know if i want to be i don't have time to be moving around with that kind of oh distraction God, that's interesting uh i've been reading a little and bit i still love course. them like maybe i'll buy one and just keep it in a garage and just look at it <laughs> but I don't know. The byproducts of success, when you start having some money flow into your life, you can now have options to do things and spend time or mm -hmm. pick up hobbies that you maybe couldn't afford before. Yeah. Has any of that Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's plenty of things now that I could easily afford, things that I was, like, dying to buy and own. And it's like now I I have no interest in attaining it. I don't know what it is. Um, it's just kind of educating yourself and realizing what's important and you know what your true priorities are i guess so you want to be completely financially free mm -hmm. yeah yep yep the plan is to own 80 homes or 80 doors by the time i'm 42 years old whether that's you know a mix of apartment buildings or duplexes or fourplexes um yeah uh what do you think about like all the Grant Cardone training and all that stuff. Um, I haven't. I've listened to a couple of his interviews. Um, maybe no more than an hour and a half to two hours of just different combined short YouTube videos. And I think he knows what he's talking about. He's he's very um, educated in certain aspects of of real estate, especially he's the one in, that's really into multifamilies, right? Um. But yeah, I mean, everyone has their own, you know, ideas and goals. So I don't want to say he's a hundred percent the best person to listen to or not. It just kind of depends what your goal is and you know what gets you going. If he's the type of person that gets you going and will get you into real estate, then go with it. I guess the kind of the question is like, you look at someone like that and then you say, how can you speed up the process? Do you want to go faster? Mm -hmm. Do you like the pace that you're going? Yeah, I would definitely like to go faster, um, but, you know, it's all about, for some reason, I don't know, it's all about figuring it out, you know, there's little things that are holding me back that wouldn't hold other people back, and, you know, vice versa, so. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's great, I mean, if 31, how many 31-year-olds do you know that have 14 properties and are driving a Porsche and, you know, have your, your head together the way that you do, most importantly, and um there's a lot more out there than you think i always say <laughs> huh? i feel very like behind sometimes yeah. especially when you get on youtube and you start looking through things so yeah <laughs> uh, i can say for sure uh andrew is the one friend that i have uh and i got a lot of friends but andrew forever i i dude i could trust andrew with a million dollars in cash i wouldn't even think twice about him here hold on to this million bucks and i could disappear for a decade and i know that it would all Hopefully, I'll still be there. <laughs> <laughs> it would still all be there. <laughs> I, I mean, I totally trust you, man. I trust you. You have very high morals and ethics and integrity. That's awesome. So um, you were thinking about, uh, in the future, maybe putting together 
I don't know, maybe a YouTube channel or some videos about real estate or anything? Yeah, I think... Uh, sharing, kind of documenting your Yeah, journey. my business partner that I do the flips and the Airbnbs with, I think we want to do like some educational videos on just how to get started in, Air, in Airbnb and uh, ways that you can systematize it. Because I feel like we've had a lot of people ask us like, you know, how did you originally get started? How are you managing these these five Airbnbs that you have? And at the end of the day, like we've had... I think we've had our five properties for, we've had all five now for just over a year. And once you get into it and get it systematized, it isn't that much. Like I feel like five is is nothing now. I mean, there's probably people out there with a hundred plus Airbnbs, you know? Um, but we've had so many qu- people ask us like how we got into it and how we systematize it and just little questions here and there. And there's constantly, th- I noticed the other day, there's constantly little issues that are coming up that take a whole lot of our time that day that we have to go respond to this and answer it. But then we immediately put a system in place so we do not have to deal with that problem again. And next time it only takes us five minutes to take care of, or we don't have to do anything to take care of it. So I think, you know, we want to put some together some training videos so people have all of those issues out in front of them and give them a huge running start of how to get started in it. A map, a guide through the minefield. Yeah. That's all. Awesome. And it still won't have all the answers, but, you know, it'll give them a huge advantage of, uh, above what we had. You know, if if it's taken us a year and a half to put five together, maybe if we make this video for someone, someone can take it and do 15 Airbnbs in a year and a half if they have that head start. So... I remember you showed me this like private video, like, don't share this with anybody. It was like this amazing production of you guys were going to do a TV show or something. Yeah, so we had um, someone contacted my my business partner through uh, it was some real estate forum that he was on. I think I almost want to say it was like Bigger Pockets. Um, they just saw that he was involved in Detroit real estate and stuff, and um, they contacted him and they wanted to do a, a show on Detroit flips, people flipping homes in Detroit. So they came out and made this whole sizzle reel and everything, sent it out to a couple different. Uh, production companies or networks or whatever tried to get it to get them to pick it up didn't end up going anywhere but it was fun that's still cool and i'm actually i'm almost glad that didn't happen because i don't know if i'd want to be on tv (laughs) and dealing with that whole production thing because they did the sizzle reel probably took them about um i think it was maybe a two or three day process and it really slowed us down like process wise of Huge how we normally manage our flips in and, and get through things. Like I remember at one point, Steve and I looked at each other and we're like, do we want them following us around? Like this is, this is really slowing us down. Like it, you weren't able to do what you'd be able to do off camera. And it was like, it, it kind of brought the reality to it of all that stuff going on on those flip shows. It's not as much as you think. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a whole, whole separate reality out of reality tv i guess <laughs> absolutely um so yeah i don't know if we had the chance to do it again i don't i don't know i i don't think i'd do it and we didn't even make it to tv <laughs> no that totally so. makes sense or because it's a, it's like a huge distraction because it's yeah. not the real thing right but if you had something leveraged where it somehow could bring you a whole bunch of opportunities and you were you were able to you know monetize off that and then build it into your business then it makes sense yeah but to do it just to do it it's like unnecessary right uh, unnecessary yeah business. i mean what we would have got out of that income wise it would have been it's it wouldn't have made it worth it compared to now it's probably slowing us down and we're doing five less flips a year because we're taking our time to do the show, you know, it's like yeah. you're making less money just to be in the public eye. And then you have all that to deal with. So what's the kind of like the, the biggest tip or mindset tip you could say if somebody is, uh, you know, they're in their small business and they want to, uh, you know, start leveraging themselves in the, into real estate and just get their first property, their first rental property or flip something. What would you say is like the biggest step that they can take to keep get that ball moving forward um to actually like go out and buy their first property yeah i would say um find a real estate agent tell them exactly what you want you know figure out uh how much you have to put down and what you want cash flow wise and you know have them find the properties for you try to find 
uh, land contracts, that's the easiest way I think to get in is the owner financing because you don't have to qualify for a mortgage or anything. And most uh, sellers that are going to do a land contract aren't going to look at your credit or ask for income. Some of them might here and there, but a lot of them, you know, get the idea of you don't have good credit or you might not have credit at all. And this, this is kind of how you're getting into your first property. And they're willing to take the risk on you because they know if you stop paying or whatever, they keep your down payment, they take the house back, all the payments that you've made, they get to keep. So, you know, they're more inclined to take that risk and, and give you the chance. That's cool, man. So uh, Instagram, check them out, at Lord Sontag. I'll put a link in the description below. I'll, put, I'll also put a link in the description below for the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book on paperback. And I'll also uh, below a subscription to audible.com. If you don't have time to read, uh, you can also listen to this on audiobook. The audiobook version is great. So it'll, it'll say audible below and then links to his stuff. And then also a link to a couple videos that uh, – I did with him and he's in my vlog and you can see his properties and all that stuff. It was from Which that was very ago. early on. So it was yeah. I think that was like the second and third flip. So which is a cool thing yeah. because now we're going to actually I'm going to come check out uh one of your properties and do a vlog soon within the next couple of weeks here. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That works. Okay. And uh now's a good time to hit the subscribe button, tap the notification bell so you get notified when I upload a new video and then let me know what you think of this episode in the comments below. You can also check out this podcast on Stitcher. Uh, Radio, Anchor FM, iTunes, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Libsyn. You can go to my website at www.keithkelfis.com. Click on the podcast tab, and you can listen to these podcasts as well, as long as all the other podcasts that I've done and new upcoming podcast episodes. You can listen to them while you work. So pretty cool. All right, I'm Keith Kelfis, Andrew Sontag. Thank you so much, man. It's awesome. And go out there and get it. Later. See ya.